Good morning. Welcome to worship this Sunday morning, the sixth Sunday after Pentecost. My name is Katie Swartz, and I, along with other faith partners, will be leading our worship today. Throughout this season after Pentecost, we have been exploring stories of God's people recorded in the Old Testament and thinking together about what they have to say to us today. Feel free to follow along with today's worship using the electronic bulletin. You can access the bulletin by clicking on the link in the description below. And now we proclaim that this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all and also with you. Let us pray. Author of life, living word, holy breath, we have stumbled through the week and groped our way back to this holy space, back to you. Illumine the steps before us and write your word on our hearts, for we carry the name of Jesus and would walk in the light of his love. Amen.
scriptures are filled with stories of people just like us, men who grieved, women who questioned, siblings who did not get along, parents who chose favorites. God's word of grace is meant for people just like us. There is no need for pretense. When we come before God, we come openly. Therefore, let us confess our sins together boldly. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways, to the glory of your holy name. Amen. God, who is rich in mercy, loved us even when we were dead in sin and made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. In the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. Almighty God, strengthen you with power through the Holy Spirit that Christ may live in your hearts through faith. Amen. Be reading from Matthew chapter 13. That same day Jesus went out of the house and sat by the lake. Large crowds gathered around him. So Jesus got into a boat that sat while the people stayed on the shore. Then Jesus used stories to teach them many things. He said, a farmer went out to plant his seed. While he was planting, some seeds fell by the road. The birds came and ate all that seed. Some seeds fell on rocky ground where there wasn't enough dirt. That seed grew very fast because the ground was not deep. But when the sun rose, the plants dried up because they did not have deep roots. Some other seeds fell among thorny weeds. The weeds grew and choked the good plants. Some other seeds fell on good ground where it grew and became grain. Some plants made 100 times more grain. Other plants made 60 times more grain and some made 30 times more grain. Let those with ears use them and listen. So listen to the meaning of that story about the farmer what what is the seed and fell by the road that seed is like the person who hears the teaching about the kingdom but does not understand it the evil one comes and takes away things that were planted in that person's heart and what is the seed that fell on rocky ground. That seed is like the person who hears the teaching and quick accepts it with joy. But he does not let the teaching go deep into his life. He keeps it only a short time when trouble or persecution comes because of the teaching he accepted then he quickly gives up and what is the seed that fell among the thorny weeds that seed is like the person who hears the teaching but lets worries about this life and love of money stop that teaching from growing so the teaching does not produce fruit in that person's life but what 
is the seed that fell on the good ground. That seed is like the person who hears the teaching and understands it. That person grows and produces fruit, sometimes 100 times more, sometimes 60 times more, and sometimes 30 times more. Hi there. I've been busy helping with other parts of our worship service this week, but I'm never too busy to stop and chat with you for a few minutes about our word of the week. Last week, we talked about rest. When we trust that God can help us, and when we let go of control over the things we think we need to be in charge of, God can help us to recover and get new energy to serve God by serving others. This week, our word of the week is listening. What part of your body do you think you use when you listen? I bet a lot of you were thinking, ears. Well, you're right that we use our ears when we listen, but did you know that we use a lot of our other body parts too? There's a pretty big difference between hearing and listening. Hearing is when noise goes into your ear and your brain notices it. You might go outside later today and hear a bird chirping or a car driving by. But listening means that we do a lot more than hearing. Listening means that we are paying attention, that we're waiting for the sound and are ready to understand it. If an unexpected visitor showed up to your house today, you might hear the doorbell ring. But if you're waiting for an important package to arrive, you will be paying a lot more attention. You'll be listening carefully for that doorbell. When we truly listen, we use all of our body parts because our whole body is ready and waiting and excited to hear the message. Our faces are pointed toward the sound. Our eyes are looking at the person who is talking or the thing that is making the sound. Our hands and feet are still because we don't want them to get in the way of the listening. Our tummies aren't rumbling and our brains aren't thinking about other things because we are so focused on listening. It takes a whole body to be a good listener. In our story today, Jesus tells a story called a parable about a sower and some seeds. A sower is someone who plants seeds, but this sower isn't very good at his job. He tosses seeds everywhere. Some seeds get on the sidewalk, and some land on rocks, and some land in the good soil. While the story might be a bit confusing, Jesus explains it after he tells it. He says that the seeds are like God's message to us. God's instructions that help us to grow stronger in our faith. And the different kinds of soil are the different ways we might hear or listen to that message. If God tries to show love to us, but we aren't paying attention, we might miss it. Or even if we do hear it, we won't be ready because we weren't truly listening. Or we might think we're listening carefully for ways we can serve God by serving others, but we can get distracted by something else, or maybe stop listening because we don't want to do what God is asking us to do. But if we are still and listen carefully, knowing that God loves us and trusting that God will always be with us, we can be like the good soil. We cannot just hear God's voice, but we can truly receive God's amazing message of love and forgiveness and peace. And we can allow God to change us from the inside out so that we can start to look and sound like Jesus. Then we can be part of the message, part of God's voice to others. If only they use their listening ears, their listening eyes, their listening hands and feet, their whole listening body. Will you pray with me? Loving, listening God, sometimes it's hard to really listen. We hear so many things every day. Help us to listen for your voice and to trust you when things get tough or noisy. Amen. Thanks, everyone. Have a great week. Psalm 119, verses 105 to 112. Your word is like a lamp for my feet and a light for my way. I will do what I have promised and obey your fair laws. I have suffered for a long time. Lord, give me life by your word. Lord, accept my willing praise and teach me your law. My life is always in danger, but I haven't forgotten your teaching. Wicked people have sent a trap for me, but I haven't disobeyed 
your orders. I will follow your rules forever. They make me happy. I will try to do what you demand forever until the end. Listen, O people, to the stories of God. Prepare your hearts to hear God's word. Let us pray. God of life, by the power of your spirit, come to us now. Focus our ears, bodies, and hearts on you so that we might be ready to listen for your word and to carry that word into our waiting world. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. A reading from Genesis chapter 25. These are the descendants of Isaac, Abraham's son. Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac was 40 years old when he married Rebekah, daughter of Bethuel, the Aramean of Padan Aram, sister of Laban, the Aramean. Isaac prayed to the Lord for his wife, because she was barren, and the Lord granted his prayer, and his wife Rebekah conceived. The children struggled together within her, and she said, if it is to be this way, why do I live? So she went to inquire of the Lord. And the Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb, and two peoples born of you shall be divided. One shall be stronger than the other. The elder shall serve the younger. When her time to give birth was at hand, there were twins in her womb. The first came out red, all his body like a hairy mantle. So they named him Esau. Afterward, his brother came out, with his hand gripping Esau's heel, so he was named Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when she bore them. When the boys grew up, Esau was a skillful, skillful hunter, a man of the field, while Jacob was a quiet man, living in tents. Isaac loved Esau because he was fond of game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Once, when Jacob was cooking a stew, Esau came in from from the field, and he was famished. Esau said to Jacob, Let me eat some of that red stuff, for I am famished. Therefore he was called Edom. Jacob said, First sell me your birthright. Esau said, I am about to die. Of what use is a birthright to me? Jacob said, Swear to me first. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and lentil stew, and he ate and drank, and rose and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. Here ends the reading. A little over a year after we got married, Bob and I spent a summer living apart. He was completing a clinical internship at a hospital in Trenton, New Jersey, and I was establishing our new home in central Pennsylvania so that he could join me later to begin a year of studying at Gettysburg Seminary, on his way toward becoming a pastor. Most of the time I was busy working or setting up our house, but when I had some downtime, I would watch TV. My favorite channel to put on was GSN, the game show network. I could turn on the TV and let it fill the quiet house with some noise while I worked, and I could take breaks and pay attention for a few minutes without feeling like I really missed anything. While I enjoyed the witty banter on the match game and the interactions between hosts and contestants on Family Feud, my favorite shows were always the ones where the contestants had to take a gamble of some kind. Whether it was one too many spins on the Wheel of Fortune, one too many higher or lower guesses on card sharks, or one too many suitcases on, on deal or no deal, the contestants almost always went too far and lost everything. And then there was the king of this kind of game, press your luck which featured this trope over and over again. Are you going to stick with the prizes you have and pass your extra spins to your opponent? Or are you going to lay it all on the line to try to win more, yelling, no whammy, no whammy, no whammy, in a futile effort to get fate and the random patterns of the big board to be on your side? Of course, my favorite part of watching these kinds of shows was how I got to feel superior to the contestants. Certainly, I wouldn't have taken that last risk. She had already won $50,000 on Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? Why would she lock in her answer knowing she only had a 50-50 chance of losing everything? Just take the money and walk away. Yes, I could sit in my living room and assume that I'd be a better player than these people who got too greedy and were punished by losing it all. But if I were really there on the stage with the flashing lights and the host all too eager to see me take a risk, 
Would I really be able to control myself? I'd like to think so, but when I'm being honest, I have to say probably not. But I also know that I'm not alone because these types of game shows prey on human ambition. And we humans have never had a shortage of that characteristic. Our focus reading from the book of Genesis today is a story of ambition. Jacob, the youngest of Isaac's twin sons, is born right on the heels of his older brother Esau. And everything he does from then on in his childhood and youth shows just how ambitious this young man is. In fact, Jacob is so well known for his ambition that children's lessons on this story often borrow a detail from the story of another set of twins born in the book of Genesis. While they aren't the same people as Esau and Jacob, they certainly sound similar enough. The twins, Perez and Zerah, battled to be firstborn so fiercely that Zerah stuck his hand out of the womb first, and the midwife tied a red cord around his wrist to mark the firstborn but his brother Perez actually emerged first, too late to claim the birthright of the firstborn. While children's stories that conflate these two narratives have slightly misremembered the biblical text, they are certainly not wrong about Jacob. After following closely on the heels of his brother into the world, we quickly jump from Jacob's birth to young adulthood. While Esau is described as a man of physical prowess, Jacob's personality seems to belie his ambitious start. That is, until one day when his brother comes in from the fields and is ready to eat anything he can get his hands on. Rather than share his meal with his brother, Jacob decides to take advantage of his brother's moment of weakness to get something out of it for himself. He demands that Esau verbally pass his birthright to Jacob before he'll share his food. While today, birth order usually provides only the benefit of getting to do things like stay out late, drive, and dictate what game is being played more often than not, there was a lot more at stake in the ancient world. The firstborn inherited both status and treasure from the father upon his death. As the eldest son, Esau was entitled to take up the mantle of his father as leader of the entire family unit, from the younger siblings and their families to the servants, and even the animals, all would be under the control of the eldest brother. Additionally, a law codified in Deuteronomy chapter 21 dictates that the eldest son would receive a double portion of his father's wealth, thus placing him at an advantage in worldly success over any younger brothers. In his ambition for power and wealth, Jacob is able to convince Esau to sell all of that in exchange for a bowl of stew. As we read on in the story of Jacob and his transformation from a crafty and underhanded younger brother to the father of the 12 sons who would form the 12 tribes of Israel, we might be tempted to assume that all of this jockeying for position was good, that God took advantage or even approved of this behavior from Jacob. After all, when it comes to building a nation, a slightly conniving but still ambitious and smart man is better than someone who is impulsive and a bit slow-witted, right? But if we look closely, we'll note that God is mostly absent from the action of these chapters, as each member of this family struggles with their own desires and the desires of their father or husband, wife or mother, son or brother. Only at the very beginning does God speak, telling Rebekah that her sons will grow into two great nations and that the elder will serve the younger. Should we read this as God's stamp of approval on the events that are to come? I'm not convinced that we should. You see, a part of the story that wasn't read today tells us what we need to know about the consequences of ambition. After tricking his brother out of his birthright, Jacob conspires with his mother to trick Isaac so that Jacob receives the fatherly blessing that was meant for Esau too. And this is the final straw for Esau, so that Jacob has to flee from his home in fear of the wrath of his brother. Jacob's ambition proves deadly, and although he escapes with his life, his family unit is never whole again. If you're the type of person who likes to play logic games and follow reasoned arguments, you might notice that I'm starting to stray dangerously close to making an argument from silence, from the absence of information, assuming that if God doesn't speak in favor of Jacob's behavior, that God must not approve of it. Many people who are much smarter than me have looked past God's silence in favor of looking at God's action, 
concluding that God implicitly approves of Jacob's behavior when God uses Jacob to continue the promised growth of Abraham's descendants into a great nation. But I think it does no harm to stop and consider that conclusion a little bit. God never says that Jacob is chosen because of his smarts, his cunning, his ambition. While I don't think we can fully come to the conclusion that this silence means disapproval, I don't know that we can fully buy into the idea that this same silence automatically means approval either. As we read the story in its entirety, we might even come to the conclusion that Jacob's behavior, Jacob's deep and pervasive ambition, is actually entirely irrelevant to God's plans for his life. Again, if we look at Jacob's story as a whole, we can see that his ambition is the cause of nothing but additional hardships for himself. After stealing his brother's blessing and fleeing for his life, the con artist becomes the victim of another con artist when he wants to marry his cousin Rachel and instead is tricked into marrying a different cousin, Leah. God uses this turn of events to bless Jacob with a large family that eventually grows into the great nation promised to Abraham. But it isn't Jacob's ambition itself that gets him anywhere. It's God's work. So today, instead of lauding the ambition and intelligence of this patriarch of our faith, or perhaps instead of ignoring or dismissing his faults as understandable and forgivable, I'd like to dwell instead on God's sovereignty over Jacob's personality. Jacob, like many humans, might be as ambitious as they come, but he doesn't become the father of the nation of Israel on his own. In fact, nothing he does makes a whit of difference at all in God's grand plan for the redemption of the world. Jacob might plot and connive and strain to feed his ambition for power and wealth and greatness, but his true greatness has nothing to do with his own actions. The meaning of his life is a gift from God. And I think this is where we find good news in today's story. This Jacob, desperate to catch up and get ahead of his brother from the very start, Schemes and plans for no reason. God is in control. God's will shall be done in his life and in our own lives. We can choose to chase after our own glory, to make a name for ourselves in this world, to satisfy our own human ambition. We can even use our creativity and intelligence for what seems to be good motives, discussing the future reopening of our in-person worship services, debating over which type of mask will block the most germs, waffling back and forth over the best way to educate our children and conduct our business and acquire our groceries in this changed world. There's nothing wrong with doing any of these things, and certainly God gave us the ability to debate and discuss and even waffle back and forth for a reason. God wants us to use those gifts. But the message we receive from the story of Jacob today, I think, is that we have to keep all of that activity within the boundaries of its own limits. We have to place all of our human efforts, all of our human ambition to fix the world or create a leg up for the people we love underneath our knowledge that God is in control. God's will shall be done. So this week, I hope you'll reflect a bit on those game show contestants and the risks and loss they experience because of an overabundance of ambition. Or if you prefer history to television, remember Napoleon who lost it all after trying to invade Russia in the winter. Or remember Julius Caesar, whose lust for power resulted in his assassination by his closest friends. And remember where all of this human ambition belongs, firmly under the foot of God, whose kingdom will come, whose will will be done. Yes, Lord, may it be so. Amen.
throughout this season after Pentecost, we will recognize the church's commemorations of various individuals and communities that occur throughout the week. This week, we commemorate Nathan Soderblom and Bartolome de la Casas. Nathan Soderblom served as Bishop of Uppsala, Sweden in the decades during and after World War I. He believed that church unity was critical to the church's witness to the gospel in the world, and so he worked to develop what would eventually become the world's ecumenical movement, in which Christians of all denominations can work together to deepen relationships and speak the good news to the world with one voice. For his efforts in uniting groups of people after World War I, Bishop Soderblom was awarded the Nobel Prize for Peace in 1930. He died in Uppsala in 1931. Bartolome de la Casas was a missionary to the Indies in the 16th century. A native of Spain, he first came to the Americas while serving in the military. He was granted a large estate with many indigenous slaves, but he freed them after he was ordained as a priest. He worked in the Caribbean and Central America to improve the lives of the native peoples, and he wrote truthful reports that rejected the propaganda of conquistadors. He died in 1566. Let us pray in remembrance and celebration. God of all nations and tongues, you desire that your church might be one as you and the Son are one. Thank you for the ministry and witness of your servants, Nathan and Bartolome. May they serve as a reminder to us of the unity and justice of your kingdom, that we might join them in ushering in the righteousness and peace that only you can give. We pray this through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let us pray for our world, our church, and for all who are in need. God of our creation, Lord of our history, Jacob and Esau stand before us this morning as examples of dysfunction and prototypes of our own behavior. Yet as Lord of our history, you brought the salvation story through the centuries to a manger in Bethlehem. Your promises exceed our own foibles and faults. Your grace covers over the history we seek to make for ourselves. Take our current events into your graceful embrace. Heal our nation's divisions. Give us leaders who lean on truth mercy and justice. Give wisdom to the people to choose persons of integrity and wisdom in order to lead us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for those who suffer from our current health care crisis. Bless us all with wisdom and patience. Teach us to care for each other in all of our actions. Show us those to whom we should reach out, those who need our support, those in need of comfort. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Bless us this season, we pray, with protection from fire. Make us vigilant, make us careful. Bless those who fight the fires and those who serve and protect the displaced. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Bless your church, we pray, that here and wherever your people gather for worship and fellowship, we might find creative ways to be your presence in the world. Bless our striving to create online worship and bless us with new understandings and strategies leading to additional ways to proclaim your mercy and grace to the world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lift up those within this congregation, we pray, who suffer the uncertainty of loss of income, health, or emotional support. Send your spirit to stir up and renew the faith of your people. Remind us of your presence in our lives at all times and in all circumstances. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. 
Into your hands we entrust all for whom we pray, trusting in your grace. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. and the sea. Your river runs with love for me. And I will open up my heart and let the healer set me free. I'm happy to be in the truth. And I will daily lift my hands. For I will always sing when your love came down. I could sing of your love forever. I could sing of your love forever. I can sing of your love forever. I can sing of your love forever. Over the mountains and the sea, your river runs with love for me. And I will open up my heart and let the healer set me free. I'm happy to be in the truth. And I will dead and lift my hands. For I will always sing when your love came down. I can sing of your love forever. I could sing of your love forever. I could sing of your love forever. I could sing of your love forever. I can sing. I can sing of your love forever. I can sing of your love. I feel like dancing It's foolishness I know But when the world is the light They will dance with joy Like we're dancing now I could sing of your love forever I could sing of your love forever I could sing of your love forever. I can 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 sing of your love. Runs with love for me, and I will open up my heart and let the healer set me free. I'm happy to be in the truth, and I will daily lift my hands, for I will always see you when your love came down. Holy and beloved ones, sow the gospel wherever you go not judging the soil on which you stand, for God brings forth fruit from unexpected places. Serve God with boldness, leaning on the grace and promise of God in all that you do and say. May God, whose forgiveness is boundless, the Christ whose charge is freedom, the Spirit which grants us life and peace, Keep our hearts and minds in grateful communion as we seek to serve. Amen.
As we prepare to exit this holy space of worship, I want to remind you that our Facebook and YouTube pages are very active. You do not have to have a Facebook or YouTube account to access these pages. I invite you to stop by regularly for news, daily devotions, and other information. Additionally, I wish to remind you that even if our church building has been closed, our church has never closed. Our ministry is ongoing and our support for our community is ongoing. We ask for your continuing prayers and financial support so that we may continue to be the hands and voice of Jesus in our world. Thank you for your ministry. Thank you also to all of our worship leaders this morning for sharing their time and gifts for the benefit of our community and the kingdom of God. And now we close this morning's celebration together. Go in peace, love and serve the Lord. Alleluia. Thanks be to God. Alleluia.